Hello, Judy Mae Murphy here. Let's go. We are doing a complete life redesign today. So what I'd like you to do is make sure that you are comfortable. Make sure that you have lots and lots of paper, not typing it into a device. It goes in very differently. And also when you have it on paper, you can look at it again. You can pin it up places. You can remind yourself. You can redesign. You can connect different things together in just a lot more immediate way, a way that is connected with your emotions. So uh, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing it for uh, 90 minutes. If you do need to take a break, make sure that you do come back and finish the rest of it because we often promise ourselves that we will do things and we're just kind of adding to this great big pile of things, like a big laundry pile in our lives and we don't want that. This is the opposite of that. This is about knowing what's important, identifying what's important and what is our dream, what our dream is made of, what our future selves are made of and then making sure that that gets done, not that it gets half done or a little bit done and then abandoned. Right. I remember when I used to be really untidy and um, I would go and be so pleased at myself for getting the laundry done. It would be washed and dried. And I would think I was some kind of a domestic goddess genius type, uh, which I so wasn't. And, and then what would happen would be it would be in this pile and I would just draw from the pile when I needed it. And that would work for a while, except just emotionally it didn't work. And then also it created hassle when I had to match socks, when I had to rummage through the pile. And then before the pile was worked through, before I'd worn everything in the pile, it already was kind of grubby and dirty because of where it was sitting. So we want to make sure that you don't have a life that's like that. You want, I want to make sure that you have the kind of a life that you can just access everything that you need easily, clearly, consistently, that you know that there's very little time lag, very little gap between you having the idea, recognizing that you want something and making it happen. And the biggest part of that is making sure that you know what you want and what you need and that you are prioritizing your wants as well as your needs. A lot of us are living a life where our needs get barely met. People will And I'm talking about people who are in countries where everything is available to them, where they can find a way, make a way, where the people are there, where the information is there. And the fact that you have found me here means you probably come from one of those countries. So uh, because you come from that part of the world and you are in a place of safety right now, um, if you are not, if you have a situation that might be something like um, domestic violence or maybe that you have um, a behavior that you're running that keeps you unsafe, please reach out to somebody in your in your environment, in your community who can help you with that, whether that's a self-help group, whether that is um, a, a doctor, a, a, a good friend. But we're presuming that everyone is coming at this from a place of safety and possibility. Right. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to realize why are we even doing this? Because sometimes what's happened is we've had an idea for something and we've been disappointed. And then we say, and I hear this so many times, um, usually after I appear on television and people will stop, stop me in the street and they'll say, yeah, but I tried it and it didn't work for me. And if you're in that place of wondering, is it going to work for you? There are elements that were missing. Maybe it was that you needed to hear it a few times. Maybe it was that you needed to do it in a less dutiful way. Maybe it was that you weren't really imagining what you wanted, but just a version of what you thought you should want. Maybe you were trying to get through a dream list or a to-do list that has been around for um, years, decades even. So this is what I would like you to think about is what if you could have an absolutely blank slate to start from And if you were to agree to do the things I'm going to ask you to do, that you massively increase the chance of getting those things. I'm not going to guarantee that everything that you that you imagine today, you're going to make happen in the near future. I'm not I'm not promising you that, but I am promising you this. How can I promise you this? Because I've been 24 years in this industry now coming up on 24 and um, I've seen people um, make things happen. And it's it's very rarely a straightforward process. But these different ways that I'm going to be talking to you, it's going to be quite hypnotic. I'm going to be putting images into your head. I'm going to be inviting you to create images. And when we do that, when we create a clear picture of tomorrow in that way, it enables our brain to work out 
What is it that's important to do today? You might know that there's a part of your brain called a reticular activating system, which is pretty much a filtration system that tells you focus on this rather than this. It does your prioritizing for you without you having to make the effort and think about it. It just it just happens. Just things will you'll be more drawn towards certain things and you'll filter out other things. When your reticular activating system has been given really, really great coordinates, it knows exactly what it is to filter in and filter out, then you'll find yourself just being brought higher by the tide simply because you'll be surrounded by all these great ideas and people doing it. And, and that's what we're getting you to. So the very first step is you've got to do the basics yourself because then you get to a place where the suggestions, the standards, the people, everything starts coming to you. Your dream is brought to you. But for the first step, you have to first bring yourself to your dream. You got to do this work and it's going to be fun. And it's because it's going to be all about you and your ultimate destiny. Who doesn't love that, right? Um, and a thing that I want you to not do, for those of you who are really good at finding what won't work, if you're really overly good at creating safety when there isn't even danger yet, right? If you're the kind of person who, as soon as we suggest that you're going to go on this fabulous holiday, you, you are saying to yourself, what are the plane crashes, right? There's a, you know, you, you have your use, you have your function throughout history, but it doesn't happen here. So I want you to just, just to let go of any idea of what could go wrong. I want you to let go of any idea of also how are you going to do it? Those of you who are the how-to people, the moment I'll say something like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had a, if we had a really great stir fry this evening with um, every kind of um, Chinese or Japanese or Thai style vegetable imaginable? What if we, you know, um, found vegetables that were exactly the ones to make a perfect stir fry? Wouldn't that be great? And immediately you've left the feeling of, oh my gosh, yes, that would be great. That would be terrific. Because you're doing the very useful thing of thinking, hmm, what can I put into Google to try and source these? How can I make this happen? What I'd like you to do is let go of the make things happen part for now. You're going to be going over this again and again and again. You're going to want to. You're going to be compelled. You're going to be drawn toward this once you have it designed. But on the first pass, we're not caring about the how. We are really just getting ourselves emotionally involved in this, getting ourselves so excited by it that that then is your brain's biggest indication of this is what we need to go for. Why do we need to go for it? Because we are emotionally connected to it. It works in both directions. If you are negatively emotionally connected to something or someone, you think about them a lot, right? If there's someone who traumatized you, terrorized you, even years later, you think about them. Or, you know, if there's someone who is causing you pain because you want to um, be with them romantically and they don't want to be with you, you obsess, right? But equally, if you love something, you can obsess about it. I remember one of my very early obsessions was an awful thing. I, I wouldn't go near it now. And it was a yogurt that was really artificial tasting, but it tasted of hazelnuts. And Back in the uh, 70s and 80s, so in 70s into the 80s when I, I was a kid, um, there was a real lack of intense flavours or different flavoured things. Coming from an Irish family, we ate a lot of things the way Irish families did. We had carrots, we had potatoes. Yeah, big cliche, I know, but it's true. We had potatoes. Um, uh, until the age of 16, I used to eat meat. So it would be like um, gammon steaks one night, mince meat the next night, um, maybe rashers and sausages the next night or hamburgers and then you're back again and you're just you know rinse and repeat and and so I became obsessed there is a point to this story trust me there's a point to everything that I'm telling you and um, I became obsessed with hazelnut yogurt because it was different it was different and uh, my mom was actually a really great chef really great great cook and she used to um, every now and then she would do something like make us um, a, a lasagna and when I became vegetarian she'd make vegetarian lasagnas and it was just like Christmas anytime she did that it felt so so good so what we've got to realize is your emotional set point compels you toward taking the actions so I would go and spend my pocket money and go to the shop on my way home from school 
to a small little supermarket and I would I would buy hazelnut yogurts rather than save it for sweets or comics, right? The way other 10 and 11 year olds did because I was compelled to do the different thing. Then I turned 16 and my mom, um, bless her heart, she learned how to make this vegetarian lasagna and she'd make that. But I had no problem going across, but by then there was a big supermarket across the road from us, no problem going across the road and buying those ingredients for her so that we would have that to happen. So there is an immediate connection, a powerful connection between how you feel and what you do either to be drawn toward doing something or to move away from it. So this is why we're not worrying about, we're not worrying, right? we're not going there. We are literally feeling great about it. We're imagining it's only going to be great. And we are really allowing ourselves to feel that and to stay in that feeling, to stay in that feeling of this is going to be a great vacation, to stay in that feeling of, oh, I love the taste of a really great style, a Thai style stir fry try and say that <laughs> 20 times fast. Um, and um, uh, um, rather than bringing yourself into the more cognitive functioning place, right? You're going to be doing that day to day. So this is a break from that in order that you can then do that at a much, much higher level once this round is done. I think you get the idea. All right. So um, we're creating um, a whole picture today. Um, and the reason that you're doing that is so that you know what to do today. We create a picture of tomorrow so that we know what to do today. A lot of people come to me for coaching around transforming their body. Um, I'm now in my 50s and most people can't believe it because um, I, I don't look like I've aged. But it's because I've been eating such fresh, amazing, greatly nutritious food for um, at least 20 years. And I also haven't been poisoning myself for at least 40 years, right? I think probably my my lowest point was my teens when I could, um, you know, uh, go to parties and have Fanta. And then um, also growing up in Ireland, we were, we were drinking alcohol by the age of 15, right? But that was my lowest point, like, you know, Fanta and beer at the age of 15 and um, Cadbury's chocolate. That was probably my low point. So I really, really know how um, just consistently being in love with eating great food means you don't have to think about it. I never have to think about my weight. I never have to think about um, my the way my body looks because I'm always just taking care of it. I'm, I'm loving taking care of it. So um, rather than asking yourself, what do I want to eat right now? But what do you want to crave tomorrow? So if you say to yourself, well, I wish I were the kind of person who craved salads, but I'm not. I have a sweet tooth. I'm going to interrupt that thought. I'm going to say, no, nobody is ever that type of person. You are only the type of person that you have conditioned yourself to be. At first, up until the age of 16, 18, you were conditioned by your environment. Now it's your job. So I want you to get really excited about that, that if you want to Seven days from now, if you want to crave salads, all you got to do is eat a salad every day for seven days. In that time, you'll automatically adjust the salad, the amount of this. Maybe you'll make it with too much oil on day one. Maybe you'll make it with too many radishes the next day. Maybe you'll make it, maybe you'll realize that, oh, I, you know, I need some um, some walnuts in here or, you know, you, you'll adjust on the fly. But the most important thing is your body will become used to that and it will start to crave that, right? So we crave what we are used to. Um, I remember when I lived in um, Kathmandu and I was living there for um, half a year. It was supposed to be a year, but ended up being half a year. And every single day I was eating dalbat, which is the local meal, which is um, lentils and rice. And, and that was pretty much it. Sometimes a little bit of vegetables. And I would dream about being able to eat the things that just weren't available. In, in um, 1996 in Kathmandu, there wasn't the great array that is available there now. So, um, you know, I couldn't get things like, you know, different pies or pastas or even like breakfast cereals, or it was just very, very hard to get hold of those. So I thought that once I landed back um, in Ireland, that I would immediately start eating all those things again. And I couldn't. I remember I arrived back to my parents' house. I didn't have my own place back then because I thought I'd be away for a year. I had a, had a house, but it was in Kathmandu. Um, and when I landed back in Ireland, 
I, um, I didn't go for all the amazing things that were available to me. Everything that was available, everything that was available in my parents' house, everything that was available in the huge supermarket across the road. Why did I not go for everything great that was available? Why are you not currently going for everything great that, that's available? Because your palate isn't set to that, right? You're not, you're doing the first bit, which is the visualization, but then you're not stepping into making that your norm. So this is step one. We're going to be doing the visualization and then you're, you're going to keep going back and you're going to keep imagining. So for the first few days, I just kept opening the cupboards in my parents' house. All I could eat was white bread toast. My palate had become so normalized to lack of diversity that all I could eat was white bread toast. And I think then I moved up to something else Oh, rice. Yeah, I <laughs> had rice and then some eggs. And that's all I could do for the first few days. So I don't want you to lose hope because we're going to be reconditioning you. But first of all, you've got to have the vision to get yourself in that kitchen, get yourself in that supermarket, know what's available. But then also we have to have it that you start to just eat a little bit of it. So that's what I started to do. I started to eat a little bit of this more exciting food, a little bit of that more exciting food. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd abandon a cookie halfway through. I would, and it took time. It took time. But eventually I started to um, eat a more diverse palate and started to crave that. Same then a couple of years later, maybe six years later, no, not even five years later, when I realized that I um, needed to eat really healthily. I, I found out about live foods and I wanted to create a situation where I, I craved those foods. So what did I do? I did, a, I did a 30 day challenge. And in that 30 day challenge for the first 10 days, it didn't feel very good. It didn't feel good. A, because I hadn't worked out how to work it for me. So I was eating things like tomatoes and celery with tomatoes and just things, combinations that just didn't work out. Now I love celery with hummus, celery sticks and hummus. I'll eat that. But celery in a salad, still no, right? Um, uh, tomatoes, as tomato juice or in, you know, in some kind of a, um, a dish, yes, but raw, no, really can't do that still to this day. Um, but I found a way to introduce lycopenes, introduce um, tomatoes into my diet consistently without having to do that. But what did happen was I got a feel for having live foods and live foods only. And I then extended that 30 days. And I think it was about three years where I didn't have any processed foods, none, right? And, and, and but it, it wasn't hard. And your life, it's not going to be hard for you to get that dream car, that dream house, that dream person. All of those things are not going to be hard for you because you're going to A, have that vision, which we're creating today, and then you're going to step into that. You're going to start to crave differently. But first of all, let's get your mind craving, right? And the body will follow suit, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create better problems. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, what kind of problems do you want to have in your future? Hopefully you've been noting down when you've been getting some ideas so far, but really start taking notes now. What kind of problems do you want? I realized when I was first given this exercise to do, I was like, wow, I want this problem. I want the problem that I've arrived at my Swiss ski chalet. I ended up realizing I don't like skiing or snowboarding. I don't like Swiss chalet. I just don't. I, I, I tried it. I didn't like them, but it was great because it moved me on to the next level. So again, it's not about everything happening exactly as it is on the list. It's about getting you to your next level. And now I have what are for me much better vacation and time out and just day to day um, living spaces than that. But at the time, the way I thought about the problem was, what if I arrived at my Swiss ski chalet and I had forgotten to bring a key? I was like, wow. And, and then I started to imagine myself, you know, well, would I break in? Well, I could because it's my, you know, it's my window. I can break my own window. It's my place. I can break into my own place. And then I started thinking about, oh, maybe I'd have a friend down the road and I could leave a key with her. Oh, now it's a Swiss, a, a, a Swiss ski chalet with friends. Great. So it's just it was built out. Um, but very often we think about it in terms of not having any problems and what it does then is it, it our brain doesn't really believe it because our brain is so used to problem solving in small ways all day. Yesterday, I normally am really good at leaving the keys in the exact same place. For some reason yesterday, didn't happen. Suddenly I walked past, saw the keys weren't there. Whoa, where are the keys? My first thought was, uh, did I leave them in the door? No, I didn't. Um, it just they, they were just in my coat pocket. 
but that's not where they go. So I was able to uh, take them and put them um, back in that place where they always go. That's going to be relevant information for later uh, when we talk, when we do the, uh, the awesome adulting section of, of this, uh, this little workshop that we're doing here together today. Um, so, so this is what you have to do is you have to realize your brain only believes problems. So you've got to create a situation where your brain believes in your dream because it's not being presented purely as gloss and you're retaining the amazingness of it. So again, we're not saying, oh my God, the plane's going to crash. No, we're not doing that. But what we are doing is, I'll give you an example. For someone I coached, I coach a lot of people in the, uh, the music and film industry. And this one person, I, um, he was he just really, really great. And he had been uh, working, getting a few scripts sold here and there, um, getting some work doctoring scripts. He had a, a whole background um, in, in college of uh, writing films. And what he wanted was he wanted to write, he wanted to be part of a writing team for a whole television series. And he wanted to win a, um, an Emmy. I got that right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was an Emmy. He said he wanted to win. And so what we did was, you know, he said, I've, you know, I've tried visualizing my acceptance speech and everything. I said, well, hold on a second. If you're part of a whole group, who's going to make the speech? And he said, oh yeah, actually probably the head of the, like the, the, the head of the writing department. I said, well, do you want to be that? He said, no. I said, so you imagining yourself writing the speech isn't going to get you any further. And also it's not going to be just you standing there. Let's make this really, really real. Where are you going to keep it? Once you get the Emmy, where are you going to keep it? Now he was um, in the process of getting divorced at the time. And he said something like, oh, well, he said it sarcastically. He said, well, um, my soon-to-be ex-wife will probably um, decide that it's hers because um, she was with me while I was a freelancer. And I'm like, yeah, she probably will. Who else will want it? And he said, my mom. My mom will think that she should have it. And I said, and, who, and where do you want it? So for him, having the problem of saying no to his ex-wife, maybe even having to legally back that up, um, saying to his mother, um, no, mom is staying in my house and realizing that he wanted to keep it in um, the, the downstairs bathroom because there was nothing else good about the downstairs bathroom. And there was a mirror there. So if people wanted to pretend that they had won an award, they could do it in, you know, in the privacy of. Um, and there's nothing else distracting from it. And also, you know, it would kind of keep him humble. So all these different reasons, he now, he solved the problem of where to keep this award. I'm pretty sure it was an Emmy. Um, he ended up winning lots of awards and, uh, including the Emmy. And I had forgotten, I hadn't forgotten about him, uh, cause I actually, um, uh, coached him on and off, um, over the years. And, uh, but I remember just when I got, uh, I got the photograph. And it was a couple of weeks after the award ceremony and I knew he'd won and I did the usual on Facebook wishing him we were saying, well done, congratulations. But that is a really, really good example of, you know, don't terrify yourself. Don't get yourself out of feeling good, but just give yourself a credible problem around all of these things. So think right now about an, um, one thing you definitely know that you want to make happen. If it, is it a, you want to get a book credibly published with a really great publishing house, not just you know, disappearing because you've published it yourself, but, you know, really well published book. Is it that you want to um, get your body to look a certain way? Is it that you want to, right, have a think about this. Who's going to give you a hard time about that? I, we, we're getting all the negative stuff out of the way quickly. Who's going to give you a hard time about that? You know, do you have a brother-in-law who, when you start to get really, really muscly, He'll start to crack jokes at, at family functions about, oh, um, you, are you going to go and, um, you know, uh, uh, get a deep tan and start covering yourself in oil? I'm surprised you didn't show up covered in body oil or um, start calling you Popeye or like or start calling you Arnold Schwarzenegger or like who, who is that person? Who's, who's going to who's not going to let this be a celebration? Now your brain is connecting it to your reality and maybe even getting you to take it out of your unconscious and say, yeah, you know what? That was one of the things that was holding me back. I'm going to have to need for them to be okay, for them to have a really, really tough time with it. Who, who is your dream going to hurt is in fact a very, very positive question because you don't want to hurt people. And very often you're trying to not outshine 
You're trying to bring everyone along with you, whereas your job is to run way ahead of the tribe and let them get inspired to catch up. What is something that might not be smooth sailing, but is very, very fixable? I remember when I was doing my uh, master's in literature, I got, I didn't expect this. Um, I got my, um, my thesis returned to me for spelling. He said, you know what? There's like, there's nothing that I want to pull you up on because we've done so much work on it myself and my supervisor. I've been at it for three years. There's nothing I want to pull you up on when it comes to um, the, 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 the content, but you are going to have to, um, you know, pay someone to proofread it. Because back then we didn't have things like Grammarly. This was back in the uh, very early 90s, right? That was unexpected. Can you imagine an unexpected glitch? So there's an actress who um, I um, coached and we, again, were, um, it was around her going um, on a big TV show. So a great big TV talk show that she wanted to go on. It's like, right, we're getting you there. And we kept that, we kept that, we kept that as her thing. And her thing that she was imagining was, she was imagining that she would wear um, tights and, because um, she loved to wear like shorts, still does, I think, loves to wear short skirts. And she was wearing tights. And right before she would go on, she would notice that there was a big um, run in the tights. I said, well, A... Um, I know I've, I've worked on those kind of shows before. I, I know people who work on those shows. They would just hold it for two minutes and wardrobe would, hu- would hustle. It wouldn't be your problem. And, and let's, ha- you know, how many pairs of tights do you want to bring with you? Bring five pairs of tights. So that can happen to you four times before it even becomes a problem. And we just talked about, you know, let's, let's look at that. Let's look at that as a reality. So she imagined going on this show, her tights ripping right before she went on stage, the, um, the floor manager saying, hold on, hold on, we got a problem. Someone running up stairs to her dressing room, getting the tights and her changing into her tights and then, and then it becoming a story that she, that she told um, to, the, to the interviewer, right? It, it turned out that nothing went wrong with her tights. I don't even know if she wore tights, but you can see how this works. This works in terms of your brain starting to believe your better self, your better future self, your amazing future. Because what happens instead is we predict the future based on the past. So this is why we have to flood ourselves. We have to immerse ourselves with these kind of exercises from different angles at all times. You know, I really hope that anytime you hear that I'm doing something like this live, that you will show up in person because again, it, it's another level when you're doing stuff in person. Well, this is more than enough for right now, more than enough. We're going to get you absolutely to that next stage. So um, yeah, first create the problem. And then you're going to know that you can solve that problem. So then you can just let go of any kind of crunchiness or tightness or I don't know how. Your job isn't to know how. You don't have to know how. The most successful people are the people who think it's not their job to know how. It's just their job to have the vision. And that's the case with you right now. It might become your job to work out how, but right now it is not. All right. So back to the idea of when we engage emotionally with our visualization, our brain believes that we've been there before, right? Our brain, if we we engage with it emotionally, if we see it and feel it, our brain doesn't know that this is the first time. I've had times where I'm doing something for the first time, but I'm like, this doesn't feel like the first time. You know, recently I, I got to do something. Um, I won't share what it is because um, it involves somebody else, but it um, uh, involves a, a, a group of other people. Um, and, um, you know, it, it hasn't, uh, the whole thing hasn't come to fruition yet. So basically I can't share the details. I'm not just teasing you. But I remember my, I, I had visualized that with those people. I'd visualized it over and over and over and over again. So that when I was got to that place, I was a bit confused. I was like, wait, when was I here before? I have been here before. And I was really thinking, was I here before? And I forgot it. But it really was that the visualization was that strong. Some of the, the, the clubs that I've been, private clubs that I've been members of over the years, some of the people who are now really, really dear friends of mine, at one point, they were just an idea that had a, an intense amount of emotion. I will be friends with that person. I know I will. I just know it. And then even without me having to do anything, I'm automatically getting myself into those spaces and becoming friends with them. Invitations that I have to do different things, to speak on this amazing stage, to speak in front of these really exclusive private group of people, to like all those different things are because 
I have gone there before. So everything in my life starts aligning to keep bringing me closer and closer toward that. All right. So um, so make sure, this is my way of saying, make sure that you really, really feel it. And also that you don't get, kind of get dragged back by the idea of, but I can't do that right now because I don't have time. I don't have money. My kids need me. Um, I'm ill. I'm Ill. like, yeah, we've all got versions of that. And maybe we don't have it as bad as you have it. Maybe you are very curtailed in the other stuff that you can do. But you know what? While everyone else is watching TV, you can go upstairs and you can lie on your bed and you can visualize again. That's all it takes. I love the actor Barry Keoghan. He's from um, Ireland. He's from Dublin, from where I'm from. And he, um, I grew up in the poshest part of Dublin and he grew up in the least posh part of Dublin. Um, but he didn't let anything stop him. He just said to himself, right, I'm having this. And he just decided. And he just did everything that he needed to do. Right. And he did what he could when he could. So at the time when he didn't have even a phone of his own, I mean, that's honestly his, the area he grew up in, the flats, it was impoverished. It was just like bandit country. The most beautiful people, like really, really tough times, like when, um, you know, drugs came into the estate that he lived on and and um, took his mother, sadly. And, um, you know, he, he really didn't have any way of making it happen, but he found a way, he made a way. And it was just pure determination. I am doing this. And so, you know, if he had to give out a phone number, he'd give his grandmother's phone number. And he, um, uh, you know, when he decided he wanted to be an actor, it was a year between him going and finding a director saying, hey, listen, if you ever make that happen, you know, I, I need to be in it. And a year later, I think his grandmother's phone uh, rang and it was, um, I might be putting two different stories together here, but um, he, he ended up, that was his first step into it. So we're not going to tell ourselves any stories about why we can't. We're just not. We're going to find a way. We're going to make a make a way. My favorite phrase that I'm sharing with you guys for the first time. You're the first ones to hear about this. My favorite phrase that I've been using for myself for the last few months is the phrase intentional socks. Intentional socks. I saw it on some sort of um, uh, high end fashion thing. And um, it was actually um, I, I, I'd, I was just flicking through it and I saw it like for guys and it's, it just was a phrase, you know, be intentional about your socks. And I was like, immediately, am I intentional about my socks? And then I started looking at what are intentional socks? What would intentional socks be for me? I'm like, okay, you know, I've got lovely socks. I've got silk socks. I've got bamboo socks. I've got, I've got some really, really lovely socks. I love my socks. I'm wearing really lovely, cozy, cozy socks right now as we speak. Um, so I'm, I'm all about the socks, right? I'm all about the socks and the cups of tea. You know, if you're making extraordinary things happen. You need to be comfy while you're doing it, right? So I thought, what are intentional socks? And I, I just went and found what are the best socks that can happen? Now, the socks that are my intentional socks, they sold out. So I have them on order, right? Um, but this is a really great idea for, let's suppose that you can't buy the mansion right now. Can you buy the crystal glass, the crystal tumbler, that you're going to drink a celebration drink out of, right? Um, a dear friend of mine um, uh, made his hundreds of millions um, through um, putting samples on board Carnival cruise ships. I'll t- just tell you the story really quickly. Um, so basically he just knew it and it took him, I think about a year for it all to come together, for him to build a business, for him to get all the different companies to um, persuade them that, about the samples to persuade Carnival Cruises, um, to get the the money from somewhere else, um, to pack them into these lovely baskets, get them delivered, and the very but the, the thing that he kept visualizing was him watching the 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 cruise ship that he would just watch the cruise ship pull out of the harbor with all of his um, sample baskets um, in in every single cabin. And he did that and he had it. I forget what the drink was. I'm pretty sure it was a whiskey. Could have been a brandy. And um, he sat there and he just, uh, you know, he, he knew that moment was coming. He knew that moment and he clung to that moment. And so for you, like, what is a thing that you can get now? You know, because I, I think that if he had um, something that if, you know, if he already had the glass that he was going to drink that celebration drink out of, that could have been a comfort to him throughout that year. Right. If he physically had it, if he, if he maybe just held it in the evening before he, he went home. Right. Something like that. What what can be your intentional socks? What is it that you can do? Is it that you say, 
when I win the Nobel Prize for Literature, I'm going to be wearing these earrings. And you just have those earrings. Those are my Nobel Prize earrings. And maybe you wear them daily. Maybe you just don't wear them until. Whatever works for you. But you have your intentional socks. You have something that links it. A thing that I did was there was something that I knew was going to always be with me in my life. And I already had it. And it was... um, uh, the, and I, st- and of course I still have it. Um, it was the, uh, the collected works, the complete works of Eugene O'Neill. Eugene O'Neill is, um, one of my three favorite playwrights. I've got three top three favorite playwrights and, and Eugene O'Neill is one of them, the Irish American playwright. And his complete works is absolute doorstep of the thing. And it meant so much to me because I got it, I bought it when I was in college and it took me ages to earn the money. It cost about 80 pounds because back then, you know, in, in the, it would have been late eighties then. And, um, those kind of books were very, very rare, right? That we're lucky these days that, um, you know, books are less expensive. They're faster. You can get them on Kindle if need be, but this is the only format I could get it in. Um, they, they had it in, um, in the library in Trinity. Um, but, um, I wasn't allowed to take it out. It was one of those books that was so precious. You couldn't take it out. And plus all my, uh, all the people in class in my class were, were checking them out. So basically this was just, it's, it sounds like such a simple thing, but anytime I would imagine future homes, even like future celebrations, I would just see myself, you know, maybe celebrating with family, but I'd see that edition of that book. So that was kind of my first version of intentional socks. So that's what I'd like you to do is take something that you already have or something that you can make happen easily right now. And it could be literal socks. And, um, and that is letting you know that, yeah, this is the first part of the dream. That already I had the complete works of Eugene O'Neill. If I'd been designing from scratch, the complete works of Eugene O'Neill would have been on the list for things that I was going to make happen. Yeah, I already had one painting. I now have upwards of 50 gorgeous works of art, beautifully framed. She said, looking around her, really, really happy looking at one I particularly like right now. Um, and, uh, and also clothes, you know, so I, w- I would imagine that. And I remember the first thing I did, the first designer outfit I got was by a designer called um, Dries van Noten. And I remember that Dries van Noten dress and I remember how it cost me everything. <laughs> it was just so hard for me to get that. But that was like, OK, I now have one designer dress. And then, um, you know, that was proof to me that the dream was coming true. So that's what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to have little things that you say, yeah, this is the next part of the dream. This is the next part of the dream. Another thing that I would do is I would go into, um, at the time living in Ireland, um, the, there was a Four Seasons and um, I would go in there and I, I would honestly have to like scrabble to, to get money to just go in and have a cup of tea. And I like many people still would. But back then I thought it was outrageous what they charged. Right. So now I'll, you know, I, I don't, I don't blink. I don't like if I end up being charged, um, let me see, I think it's about 17 pounds. The, the, the tea that I get when I'm in the Corinthia hotel, um, uh, there, there are all different prices, but the finest one, the silver needles, Japanese tea that I love there. Um, it costs about, about 16. If, if I get a, um, a freshly squeezed orange juice, it's about, what, 14 pounds there. But I remember way back in the day, that would, that would be a difference between, you know, dinner and not. So I, um, I really took it seriously and I would make sure that at least once a week I had an outfit, one outfit, even before the Dries van Noten outfit, I had one outfit that was good enough for me to get in there. Now, I know a lot of you are at a much, much higher level, but you've got your version of this. Maybe it's that you think that a, a place you don't yet belong is a particular, um, a boardroom, or maybe you think a place you don't belong is a particular uh, platform. Maybe you think a place you don't belong is a particular family dynamic. So wherever you think you don't belong, get yourself in there a little bit. Start to do that. So, Because I don't want you to be dreaming up all this great stuff, and we are getting to that, I promise you, but I don't want you to be dreaming up all of this great stuff and thinking that it's, you know, well, I've done that now. And now I got to get back to normal life. It's like, no, we're stepping into it right now. And you're going to step into it as much as you can. So that means if part of your dream life is you, you know, working out every morning and right now there's not a gym near you because you live in the middle of the countryside. Yeah, you're going to be 
doing what I paid money to do. You're going to be hauling tractor tires. When I went to LA specifically to train in MMA, and that's what my trainer had me doing. He had me um, hauling tractor tire, a, tra- a tractor tire across the um, across the car park, right? Because I was so weak. And he was like, we, you know, we just got to build some general, I forget the, the exact phrase that he used. It wouldn't have been a complicated one. He, he's, he's a very strong man and he uses very, very simple words. And I, I think he probably just said, you know, you're not strong. We got to get you strong, you know, get strong. And then he, other things he'd say is like, you know, you got to fight. So that was a place I didn't belong. I'm, I'm really, really good at this. And I want you to get really, really good at it too, is inviting yourself into places, giving yourself permission to step into places where right now you, you, the evidence would say the evidence of yesterday, because whatever you have right now is only evidence of yesterday, not evidence of today, not evidence of the future. But on the evidence of yesterday, you really don't belong there. It took me two weeks to persuade Sean to coach. I, I, I literally was stalking him. I didn't even meet him for two weeks. And then he agreed to, because I'd been like leaving messages for him in both of the gyms that he worked out in. Um, he eventually agreed to train me once. And he told me since that when he told me he was going to train me once, he, he was going to give me such a hard time, he thought I'd give up. And then when I didn't give up, he kind of got curious and he said, okay, well, we'll do another thing. And we did it. So the, I remember that first session, he almost destroyed me. And then in the next se- se- session, um, you know, uh, he said he started to have fun with me. And then he started to see, and it was, it took a while for him to see that I could actually do this, that he actually was just kind of like doing it for a combination of curiosity, money, fun, get this mad woman off my off my back. He was doing it for those combinations. So he didn't see it. He didn't have any kind of vision for me being able to fight for about the first five sessions. Um, but then as soon as he did, he was making statements like, okay, so, you know, when you get in a bar fight, and I love the fact that he saw me in a bar fight. I just loved that. I loved the idea that, that was possible. I don't know if I'm ever going to be in a bar. Maybe I will be. Maybe I will be in a bar one day and maybe a fight will break out. Maybe someone will start attacking me and maybe I'll be able to, well, I definitely will be able to fight back, right? Really effectively, really quickly um, because I now have those skills, but I had no right being in that room. So I want you to think about the rooms you would love to be in, but right now you feel or other people might feel you have no right being in them. Is it a private club in Dubai I've done loads of, of, of events and private clubs in Dubai and they're their own world. They're an amazing mix of, um, you know, uh, people who are um, from there originally, traditionally, and also people who have come in from all different parts of the world. It's a mixture of, you know, very traditional Arabic men plus um, very, very um, forward thinking, um, freedom loving, lib- liberated women. Like it's just a great, great combination of people. And you know, stepping into that, maybe you, you think, oh, they wouldn't accept me there because I'm this. Let's think about, let's, let's rethink about who you can be and let's rethink about what those spaces will allow. And you know what? If it's true that the spaces won't allow that, then you create that space. I have this really, really great um, person who I'm coaching who is a real fighter. She's scrappy. She is fascinating to me. And, and she realized that she wanted a very particular combination of place that she wanted to be able to hang out in. And she wanted this and this and this. I said, wow, that's, I, I can see that. And it's very unique and it doesn't exist in that way. You've got to go here for this, here for that. I'm, I'm just not telling you because I, I don't want to, um, I, I, I want to protect her anonymity. But um, but we realized that it didn't exist in this very unique form. And she said, it's very niche. And I'm like, yeah, that is niche. And I can, I can understand the appeal. And so now she's creating it. She's actually opening a place. She's fi- found the funding. She had the vision. And it's very, very unique. And she's, she's actually doing that. And sometimes you might have to do that. You might have to do what I did. Take yourself halfway across the world. I couldn't find someone who I really felt, again, back to feeling, the importance of feeling. I felt with Sean Crenshaw, because he was a, a professional fighter at the time, um, I felt that, and I, I was like looking at, you know, video of him, like just completely like ripped apart in the cage. Like it was just animalistic. And I was like, wow, this guy is a fighter. He is a warrior. He just, he is it. I don't want to be trained by someone who knows how it's done. I want to be trained by someone who lives, who lives it, who's a natural in this. 
And I, you know, the only way I found was to take myself from London, where I was living at the time, move myself, put all my stuff into storage, move myself over for six months to LA, um, to El Segundo, and, um, and, and, you know, track them down. And again, no guarantees, but I just had the vision, right? Such a strong feeling. I just wasn't feeling it. The idea of, you know, going into a great gym in Soho and doing it there, I just wasn't feeling it. So you've got to feel it and you've got to start getting excited about what is possible for you. So you're going to be doing incredible things and you're going to be starting with your intentional socks, right? Um, and um, just to kind of like link the science bit to this, um, there's a, a, a phrase called um, prospection and it's unique to humans or at least it's unique in a sophisticated way. And it's the act of anticipation. And when we anticipate something, that gets us moving. A lot of people are sluggish and they think that they're lazy or they think that they're tired or and they probably are tired, but they're tired in a very emotional way because they're not anticipating greatness. They are listening to people forecasting doom and gloom and more of the same and this and that. No, don't don't listen to it. I mean, obviously keep yourself safe. I mean, we, we don't want to be... Um, you know, in fantasy land around this, but we also do want to be anticipating things to be as awesome as they can for us, right? So prospection, it's viewing and exploring. So it's about you adventuring in your own possibilities. And we are designed for this as humans. So if you're not feeling good about your human experience here on the planet, it's because you're not dreaming big enough, well enough, deep enough, often enough, with enough support around it to make it happen, right? So that's you told. Alrighty, so what we're going to do now is... Um, uh, and again, keep with it. I know we've been doing this for 45 minutes already. We're already halfway through, but you needed that groundwork. So, um, so mark it at the 45 minute mark. And if you want to redo this, you can redo it from the 45 minute mark, but every now and then, you know, revisit with some of the ideas that I've been sharing with you. Okay. So we're going to be dividing this up in a very particular way. First of all, we're going to be designing out who you want to be. A lot, of, a lot of times we try and start with what we want to make happen. That's way down the road. We've got to get really, really in touch with who we want to be. So I'm just going to be talking you through this and you just write over it. If you need to pause for a second, do. But just, I would suggest the first time around, don't even try and pause it. Just write as much as you can. Just have that feeling of, oh my God, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to get my awesome future down on paper. Go with that feeling. Make that happen. So the first thing is, what emotions do you want to feel? What kind of emotions do you want to feel on a daily basis? Do you want to have the kind of day where you feel excited, where you feel calm? Maybe you've had too much excitement and what you want to feel is you want to feel really calm. Do you want to feel confident? Do you want to feel stable? Just start capturing any words that come up for you, any words that I'm saying to you that you want to capture that, yeah, like, yeah, I want to be that. Do you want to be a persistent kind of person? Do you want to be a stoic person? Do you want to be brave? Insightful? Relaxed? Strong? <coughs> Powerful? Jolly, cheerful, free, reassuring, magical, trusting, focused, active, adventuring. Emergent, unstoppable, easy, supported, clear, disciplined, brave, astute. Genius, huggy, cozy, deep, belonging, 
energized, assertive, limitless, patient, sexy, brilliant, mature, healed. That's it, keep going. Kind, sincere, trustworthy, cheeky, Who do you want to be known as? If someone was saying, oh, this person, if, if I was to ask a friend of yours, what's this person like? What would you like for them to say? Would you like for them to say that you're honest? That you are reliable? That you're a hard worker? That you're smart? That you're optimistic, creative. What is one way that you would like for people to describe you? And you know you are that, but right now other people don't think of you as that. So you know you're sexy or you know you're creative or you know you're honest or you know you're this. And other people just don't get that about you. Capture that one word. People don't know that I am a positive word, a word that you're stepping into. And now think of a positive word that you haven't yet stepped into. For me, years ago, that word was orderly. And then I stepped into it with, with how I lived my days. And now I live that. Now people will say, oh yeah, she's really organized and... I was always on time, always. Maybe for you, that punctuality, maybe that, maybe that you would like for people to see you as punctual, but you know you're not quite there yet. That's okay, we're getting you there. Maybe it's something like great with money. Maybe it's physically flexible. Maybe it's dynamic, charming, a powerhouse, indestructible, fun. Fantastic. Now we're going to be stepping into the skills that you want to have. Maybe some of those are physical skills. Maybe you want to learn how to snowboard or some circus skills. You want to learn how to fire eat or juggle. Maybe you want to learn how to do all your own DIY. There's loads of really, really great examples of that on the internet where people are like, oh my God, I've never done anything. And now people are practically rebuilding their entire houses from top to bottom learning as they go. Is that a skill set that you would like? For some people, it's sewing. They're like, oh my God, I'd just love to be able to make my own clothes. I always have this vision. I'd love to be able to make patterns and just do that and spend my evenings making my own clothes. Oh my gosh, I'd have exactly what I wanted. I could then maybe sell some to other people. Beekeeping. All I'm doing here is just kind of broadening the world out to you. Just notice that maybe you hadn't thought of beekeeping. I had an intern um, about, gosh, yeah, the, just for a couple of years before the pandemic, I had this intern and she just, I'd, I'd known her for a couple of years and um, I, I thought I knew her inside and out. And then I found out that the reason she liked going home to her dad on the weekend was because 
the two of them um, did beekeeping together. And I then said, right, we're going out for lunch. I took her to a fantastic place in Piccadilly and uh, said, I'm, you know, lunch is clearly on me. And it's because I all I want you to do is tell me everything you've learned about beekeeping. Honestly, masterclass, brilliant, fascinating. Didn't make me want to do it, but I just I learned so much. And, and, and I know that somehow it's been useful to me. Like, did you know that um, it can be quite hard to get a hive to go and stay, like a swarm of bees to stay in, in the hive, um, even though there's nothing wrong with it. There's all different tricks you got to use um, but, and how you need to, you know, talk to your neighbours about the kind of plants they have in their garden so they don't accidentally ruin your honey stock and all, all kinds of fascinating things. Is beekeeping a skill? Singing, dancing, speaking, languages. I love learning languages. I've got three on the go. I was going to introduce a fourth one. I was going to introduce um, South Korean, but I've decided that I can, I, I've given myself a task that I can, um, I can do that when I can have comfortably speak in Russian and Spanish as well as French without... Um, searching for words or sounding like I'm speaking in, like, I want to be able to have a conversation where I speak in full sentences without having to use too much effort. When I, so I can, when I can speak, um, not fluently, but fluidly, um, in all those languages, then I'm going to treat myself with, um, an intensive week of, um, learning to speak Korean and then going to, um, bring my niece, she doesn't know yet, but she's coming to South Korea. See, see how fun life can be and we forget that. We forget that this is a game. This is the game of life. All right. How do you want to look physically? Let's start with looks because it's just an easier in. Because if we talk about health, we're not really committing to it until we get sick. We, we really care about our health once we get sick. Um, but if we think about how we want to look, it's a really good gateway into caring about our health a lot more. Use words that, that capture it. Is it that, you know, or even just draw a picture? Is it that you want a six pack? Some people will be like, no, I don't care about a six pack, but I do want to be able to do the splits. Or, um, you know, I don't, I don't mind about this, but I do want to be this ideal weight. Or I don't mind so much about ideal weight, don't mind so much about having, like, being really muscly. Um, but what I do want is I do want to look proportional because right now I feel like my, you know, I, I, I have um, some people who come and they say, oh, my shoulders, I feel like my shoulders are too broad. It's like, I just want to be in proportion. So how is it that you want your body to look? Over the last few years, more people are talking about like having a really big, firm butt that never happened before. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for it, right? So whatever you want, that's what counts. And some people are very specific about certain parts of their body. They're like, yeah, you know what? I just want this. Um, there was um, uh, someone I coached uh, very early on in the uh, t- early 2000s. She's one of my very first clients. And she shared with me that, um, and she now shares it very broadly. I won't tell you her name, but she shares it broadly. So I, that's why I know I have permission to, uh, to to tell you guys about it. And her thing was that, um, she she was um. She, she had a very dark complexion, and she was so her family were from uh, the Middle East, and she had very very hairy arms. Her arms were really really hairy, and she said that. Um, you know, she she didn't shave them because she heard that make it worse and she didn't this and that. And I just said to her, well, why don't you just get it lasered off? And she was like, what is that? And she hadn't heard. And lasering was quite new back then. But she went and she, um, within a, a few weeks, her arms have been completely free of hair ever since. And she said that that and other homework, which was to go and buy red underwear, those were the two life-changing things, life-changing for her. And very often that physical change is a life changing thing for people, you know, and it might be that you've got to go and get a little bit of surgery, right? I don't advise getting hooked on surgery, but it might just be that if you're, you know, um, I, I have a, a friend in LA and he just always hated his chin and then he got like a chin implant. And he said after that, he had no problem with any part of his body. He was good. 
good to go. He was happily in pictures. In fact, he actually um, ended up being an expert where he had to, um, with a big following on YouTube, right? And he he never would have done that if he hadn't just got that sorted. Again, don't worry about the house. What do you want to get sorted? For me, it was about getting, you know, for a long time, it was about just getting my teeth done. You know, that I just didn't like my teeth and I just wanted to get, you know, my, my teeth um, brightened and then I wanted to get a couple of veneers and, and then, you know, I now have the smile that I want. What is it for you? With your physical body, what do you want to get changed? Not, not, don't worry about the clothes and the accessories, we're getting to that. But what do you want to have changed about it? Is it that you walk in a very, um, they call it duck feet way, like kind of splayed out? Um, I used to have the opposite. I, I used to walk in a very crow's feet kind of way. Do you pronate in? Do you pronate out? It's another thing that can happen with your foot where you're kind of swayed all the way in or swayed all the way out. Um, whereas the first one is about where your feet are direct, uh, the pointing to. But these little things, you, you get to design them right now. You might say something like, I don't like the skin on my neck. Fine, let's fix that. Right? You might say something like, you know, but don't worry about whether it is fixable. You just say, I would like this to be different. I would like to be taller. I, I, I want to be taller. I've got a very long torso, but um, from my elbow to my hands and from my knees to my feet, those bits are out of proportion. So I've had to learn how to dress to reproportion myself and all of the, all of the outfits that I wear. So you probably never knew that about me, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's on purpose that you didn't know that about me because I've been like, I, I had to, I learned how to, how to fix that. Now, if it was really upsetting me and it was really off, I would, you know, go in and, and get painful surgery, but I don't need to. But you just design everything about your physical body. All right, let's move on now to grooming. How is it that you, that you want to look when it comes to your hair? Do you want to have a tan? Do you want to have glowing skin? Do you want to have skin that's hair free? Do you want to have hair that is more there and maybe sculptured? Do you want to feel okay with letting it just happen? Like what, what do you want when it comes to your grooming? Do you want to have really great gums? Do you want to be the kind of person who flosses every day? I'm that person. Have been since uh, 2010. Thank you very much. <laughs> but before that, I rarely flossed unless, you know, the day before the dentist. Or the, the day before the dentist and two days afterwards was usually when I used to floss. But since 2010, I haven't missed a day. Also, I remember that I didn't have my ears pierced for the longest time. And then went and got them pierced and thought, why did I not get them pierced? I, I was way late to the game. It was, I was, it was like 2005 before I got my ears pierced. And the way I did it was about researching, getting it done for a young cousin. How else do you want to look in terms of your grooming? Do you want to look polished? Do you want to look neat? Do you want to look wild? Do you want to look, how do you want to look? Do you want to look youthful? If you're having trouble visualizing yourself any different to you are now, who you're a little bit jealous of. Jealousy is great if you use it right. It's fantastic. It's a really great emotion. It's absolutely underused. We're, we're told to keep away from it. Use your jealousy. Who are you jealous of? Why? What, I, I'd like that. Right, I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go have it. You want yourself some fame? Go get yourself some fame. You want yourself some money? You go get yourself some money. You want yourself an elegantly sculptured moustache? You go and get that. And again, we're not doing the hows. We could. I could explain to you how you can get extensions, hair extensions onto your moustache, but we're not doing that right now. We're just doing what do you want, but everything is doable. Everything is doable. This is about you getting excited, getting the image and getting the emotions around it. Now, how do you want to dress? What kind of clothes and what kind of accessories? I go, every, every five years or so, I go in a completely different direction with how I look. And right now, I'm in my kind of A-list actress phase, like power dressing with that creative edge. What 
Whereas before it was more creative, a little bit more homely, a little bit more feminine, a little bit more just in that, you know, oh, gorgeous dress, Judy May. Whereas now they don't say gorgeous dress, they say, oh my God, you look amazing. Or they just say stunning, right? That's what we want. So now I'm dressing to impress, whereas at another time, I was dressing to reassure, or I was dressing to hit a certain aesthetic, I was dressing to, so you signal differently at different times in your life. So this isn't about you looking like the cover of GQ or looking like the cover of Vogue, unless that's what you want. It's about you saying, yeah, what's the dream right now? What do I, what do I want? What do I want to move into? Do you want to move into something that's very corporate chic? Do you want to move into something that's steampunk? Do you want to move into something that's really, really like high quality but relaxed? So, you know, maybe minimalist, maybe you've got like three cashmere jumpers, but they're the best quality jumpers, or maybe you want to just dress completely sustainably. Put it all down there, because if you want to dress really high powered and really sustainably, that is so doable. Again, we're not worried about the house. It's just a, this is what I want. This is what I want. What kind of shoes, what kind of accessories do you have? I love my accessories these days. I keep them really simple because I'm not big into accessories, but I've got like this one ring that I really love. I've got this one um, like satchel, like a handmade leather satchel with my initials embossed onto it that I love. I've got um, a, a pair of silver, like silver drop earrings I really, really love. I've got, I've got very few accessories. I've got like um, a pair, a couple of pairs of sunglasses. I've got a few pairs of gloves but they are so designed, they are so perfect. And when people see them, they often say, oh my gosh, that's so you, right? They get, they, they get why I'm wearing that. It can make all the difference. Again, it's not about, well, it is about intentional socks. <laughs> and this is the place where you can design your actual socks if you choose to. Just a slight aside, I remembered um, at the beginning of the very first lockdown. Um, in fact, no, it wasn't. It was when we realized that we were going to be in lockdown over that first winter. Right. So what was that? 2020? Gosh, it feels like such an age ago. Um, so, yeah, going into winter 2020, I ordered online these really, really thick um, woolen handmade socks. And they were just absolutely bespoke and they were so cozy and I got three pairs of them and they were an absolute godsend because they just made me feel so phenomenal, so cared for, so looked after. I felt like my my feet were getting this artisanal hug <laughs> every single time. It was just beautiful. So again, the feeling has got to be there. Maybe you want to look like you're on the carpet of the Met Gala. Maybe you want to look like, you know, um, that whatever it is, whatever it is. Maybe if you want, maybe for you, it's that you want to look like you fit in. Great. What does that look like? That's important to you. It's important to me. Fantastic. Now we're moving around and we're going to be talking about the other who's. So who do you want as family? Do you want a close romantic partner? Do you want a life partner? And if you already have a life partner, you know, do, do you want them to feel happy? Do you want them to be, you can imagine things, you can't control people, but you can have an idea for what that will look like. And then you'll start treating them as if they are that person. Oh yeah, I've got a really supportive spouse. You'll start presuming they want you to do stuff and they'll respond in kind. So if just right now, realize that we're, we can completely design what would work best for us. And then we can start to notice because if you let's I've had this time and again, and it, it actually is a very happy thing. It sounds sad, but it's a very happy thing. But there's some people who they, they come to me and they realize during being coached that a nagging feeling that they've had for a very long time, that this isn't the ideal relationship for them. Um, as they start to grow into themselves, they realize that yeah, I really, like, I really want to be out there in the world and adventuring. I had this, I was with someone for six years, um, from the age of 19. 
and um, oh my goodness, the loveliest guy, and we were so in love, and we, we just, we got on so well, and he was really intelligent, and really, really kind, and the thing was that it started to kind of, like, at first it was kind of funny to me, it was funny to me that he wouldn't eat pasta, and so then I eventually got him to, about six months into our relationship, I, I got him to eat pasta, he, he would just sit there and starve. He would literally just not eat. But then he had to have the same kind of pasta every single time. It took the whole of our relationship for him to have two pasta dishes that he would eat. I remember one was um, uh, pasta spirals, like fusilli with um, mushroom sauce. And the other one had a cheese sauce. And I forget what that one was. Maybe it was spaghetti with a cheese sauce. But it took him that long. So you can imagine that for someone like me, who is all about the adventure, that as I started doing more and more and more in the world, as I started, um, you know, um, going to New York to train on Broadway, as I started to, um, you know, do a master's degree, as I started to uh, write for different publications, as I started to, um, you know, put my plays on, have my theatre company put my plays on in New York and um, start to look to, uh, you know, different places to do the, these things, it start, I started to realize that I wasn't going to be able to take him with me. And it was very sad. It took me another couple of years to break up with him. It was very, very sad, but it was very, very necessary for us both to live our ideal lives. Within two years, he had met and married the woman of his dreams. Um, and they had two kids and they have been living in um, the same house that they built the year they got married in the, in the, the end of her parents' house. That would have killed me. All of that would have killed me, right? Um, you know, and, and he stayed in Dublin and he did the, he did his thing at a very high level. Very smart guy, very loving guy. I uh, bumped into a couple of times over the years and he's doing brilliantly. But you can see how that released him. So don't be afraid of dreaming the ultimate when it comes to your relationship if you're in a relationship because either it's that there's someone even better out there for you and someone even better for them. And usually what happens is that you're not presuming that they're not going to grow and they actually grow into that ideal person for you, that they're great right now and they become even greater as you have that vision of who you guys can be together. So start thinking about your romantic relationship, start thinking about your family. Do you want to have kids around? Do you want to, I for a while, I don't, I don't have kids, but I do, um, I am respite care for other people, right? And nothing I love more than taking, um, like I've got a friend who has two, um, uh, young girls who are now in, um, their, uh, they're now in their teens, their young teens. But when I first met them, they were sort of like, um, seven and eight. And at the time I remember just talking to them about some adventures that I'd had and their mom just loved that I did that. Um, there was a time where it was an emergency situation and I became a foster mom. I was a foster mom for about three months at one stage. I don't ever talk about the details of it because that's private to the kid, but that was like a really scary and I had so much, um, still have so much respect for parents after um, that, that stint as a foster mom. Um, and there's all kinds of different th ways that you can make family. Family doesn't have to be a traditional kind of family. Um, I know someone who has found her family in a, I, I'm not her coach, um, and she, she posts on Instagram and she has her family in a warehouse. There's a term for it. Maybe someone can help me with, oh, this isn't live. I'm pre-recording it. Um, there's, uh, you know, she, she's, she lives with about 10 different people. She's very extrovert. She lives with about 10 different people. She's very noisy herself. I think you'd have to be. Um, and she, um, they all have their own separate rooms in this warehouse. And then the rest of the warehouse is mad. It's crazy. It's like literally like the way, that, if you remember the series, The Monkeys from the 1970s, they used to live in a warehouse. It's that kind of setup. She lives there. That's her ideal. And these people are her family. And they have no intention of ever moving out right? They're, they're actually working on buying the place from the owner so they can all continue to live there. So that'll give you the idea of the extent to which you can design your family. You can decide that your family is you. You can decide that your family is maybe just for now, maybe for the next level that it's you looking after you. That counts. You count. So, oh my gosh, you've got the best family member right there already. So family, what does that look like? Now let's look at your inner circle, your inner circle of friends. These are the friends between, usually between five and 10 friends who really know you. And it takes a while for people to graduate into that. 
So um, all of my really dear friends, they weren't dear close friends for the first two years of our friendship. They kind of just earned their way into that inner circle. So with all kinds of relationships, you let them be a slow build. So it's organic. So what either maybe there's someone who you, you feel like, yeah, you know what, I've lost touch with them. They are definitely in a circle. Or maybe you're just looking at the kinds of people. I need someone who, you know, really supports me and, you know, doesn't badmouth me or doesn't criticize me in this way. Or someone who doesn't just ditch me at the last minute when they get a better offer. I need... So just start designing who are your inner circle. Maybe you have a great inner circle in terms of people who love you and are there for you, but maybe you, you want more power players in the world as part of your inner circle. Maybe you want someone that you can sit down and say, hey, listen, you know, I've just made my first million and I'm looking to make this investment. You know, I, I'm terrified. And that friend can be like, oh, coming around. Yeah, I, I can tell you everything you need to know. I can tell you what happened to me. We're going to like, you're going to be fine. I've got you, right? Maybe you need one of those kind of people. So inner circle, what is it about your inner circle? I realized that most of my inner circle was in parts of the world, I realized this during the pandemic, was in parts of the world that's quite far away. And I thought, you know what, I, I want to get more inner circle um, in and around London. And so, yeah, I started working on that. Then outer circle. So your friends that aren't, they don't have access to everything about you, but you love it when like, a bunch of you get together to go to a jazz club or for, for brunch or um, that you, you know, catch up with them a couple of times a year. So who, what kind of people, maybe you've got some actual names or maybe you're just designed the kind of people are in your outer circle. Maybe they are members of a particular private club or maybe they are, you know, in your, if you like sailing, maybe they're the other sailors. If you like, um, you know, are they, that kind of group of people who you know them like you you it's not just that you see them in that place but you also go off for dinner with them afterwards and those are the people who then graduate into being your some of them will graduate into being your inner circle but for right now you're like yeah you know what I just want some more industrious people or I want people who maybe um if you're looking to have kids then you might say yeah you know what I want in my outer circle I want lots of people who are parents that's an important thing that they get that people who I can just always you know hang out with at the dog park or at the children's playground so who's your outer circle maybe your outer circle is people who are really really exciting but too crazy to be part of the inner circle I've got a few of those And who do you want for your community to be? So your community is just the people who you see every day that you don't necessarily, you might know their name, but you don't, like you, you wouldn't go off for a cup of tea with them. You wouldn't go off for a drink with them, right? You wouldn't be expected to remember their birthday. You wouldn't follow each other on Facebook, but you physically see each other all the time. They are there. It might be someone like... Um, I remember when I lived in Dublin, like in my community, was the uh, the doorman at the, the Marion Hotel. Miss Murphy, hello. Fantastic day, isn't it? Community member. I'm thinking of a particular guy. Right? Another one would have been um, a guy who I did know his name, and his name was Alison, and he was from Brazil, and he was my... Um, he was my trainer for a while. I found myself getting kind of stuck in a rut with my routine and he became my trainer, my, per my physical trainer in the gym, uh, a couple of doors down from my place. So that's the community, the person that you buy your vegetables from. Because if you don't design them, you don't expect them. I now expect it. And I always find the best people out and about. People in organic grocery stores are usually pretty solid people. <laughs> But again, we don't get confused. We don't then try to solve problems for them. We don't then think we got to invite them somewhere. We don't, we don't give them too much of our energy. We, we give them our community energy. Hi, great. How are you? And of course, if they, you know, if something happened, you're there, right? But you know where the boundaries are too.
business associates, so people who are not your friends. So these people can be real sharks and charlatans if need be, or people who just, you just don't have any excitement around them. But do you want business associates who are more into the legal end of things, who are more into the accountancy end of things, who are more, not in any way saying that, um, you know, people who are into the legal side of things and the accountancy th side of things aren't also into culture, but, you know, just business associates, just like what, what, what is the function? I think that's what I'm trying to say here. Are there some people that you want to design them according to the function that they will serve to you in your business? either in your career or your entrepreneurial endeavours. Okay, well done. You're doing great. Next thing we're going to look at is where? Where do you want to go? I want you just to create images in your head of different places. Do you want to go to, and, and we're talking about just go. We're not even talking about deciding on a place that you're going to live. We're going to do that in a little bit. But first of all, just where do you want to be on the planet? Do you want to be on top of Mount Kilimanjaro? Do you want to be in a particular country? Do you want to be on a barge in Amsterdam? Do you want to be underneath a gorgeous tree, underneath the Spanish moss in Savannah, Georgia. Do you want to be in a castle in Scotland, all on your own or with people? I spent a great day all on my own in a castle in Ireland. Um, I didn't realise that the, um, people were leaving, the, like leaving that morning. And I arranged to leave really, really late in the evening. My flight wasn't leaving until like 11 o'clock at night. And so I had an entire day and the owners were, th there's no reason for them to be there. And I thought, oh God, I got to hang out. You know, what will I hang out in, in Cork City? Like, what, what, what will I do? And the owners were so lovely. They let me hang out in their castle for the entire day. They just made sure I had food and made sure I had a, access to the tea. <laughs> That was it. It was my mine for the day. I wander around the battlements, go and read in this room, go and read in that room, stare out this window. All things are possible. Do you want to be on a beach? What kind of beach? White sand beach with really clear water. A grittier beach with loads of seaweed that wraps around your legs. Do you want to be on safari? Do you want to be in the place that someone you really admire historically is from? Or where something amazing historical happened? Just where do you want to be? Just a very simple question. Do you want to be in the outback in Australia? Do you want to be surfing in Hawaii? Do you want to be on a tiny island or in the middle of a great metropolis? Do you want to lose yourself in Tokyo? Or do you want to be up Mount Fuji? Or do you want to be in a little temple somewhere down the countryside in, in Japan? Hopefully I'm giving you lots of ideas now. And now where are two places that you would like to regularly live? After two, it gets a bit silly. Like any, I used to help clients. I used to coach them in, you know, they, they wanted to live in five different places and I'd help them work out the logistics of it and everything. But always, always, it's five is too much for like permanent homes. Two is ideal. One is too little. <laughs> two is ideal. You gotta have your place, and then you gotta have your place you go to when your place doesn't feel like your place anymore. And then you go back to your place. So choose just two places. And then you can always just rent other places or borrow them or be given them by friends, or you can always go there. Or you can always change. But for right now, what are two where are two places? And what kind of places are they? 
Is it like a shipping container turned into a home? Or is it a warehouse? Or is it an old 1930s tiny hotel that you turn into your own home? Or is it a church that you turn into your own home? Is it, what is it? What is it for you? And it's different for everyone. I had a friend recently who really had his pick of things he could do. And he chose a, re- a, he chose a really modern, but not, to my mind, interesting apartment in a very, to my mind, banal complex in, in Miami, Florida. I was like, dude, what are you doing? You could live anywhere. You can do anything. You've got the money now. You can do anything. What, what are you doing? He goes, this is it. And, you know, he, and I, I kind of got it. Like he, he wanted to be around like-minded people. He wanted to be hanging out at the pool. He wanted, he wanted tribe always to be with, there with him. He wanted the kind of place that was just easy to live in. You know, he wanted his great big flat screen TV, the size of the wall he wanted. He knew what he wanted. So don't think that you should want something. If you want something that would seem very plain to others, or if you want something that would seem insane to other people, that's for you. You want to do van life? Great. I've coached a lot of people over the years to do van life, by the way. You start by watching the movie Nomadland. That's a little hint for you. But we're not doing the house. Excellent. Now let's start looking at the what. What do you want to be able to do? What do you want to be able to do? Do you want to be able to build companies? Do you want to be um, traveling in different ways? How do you want to travel? Do you want to travel on horseback? Do you want to travel um, in a helicopter? Do you want to travel on a bike that you made yourself? Um, do you want to, how do you want to do that? Do you want to create a foundation for something? Do you want to physically build something? Do you want to make a company? Do you want to work in a particular place? Even if you don't know what that place is and how you're going to get in there, what would it look like? Would you be showing up for work at six o'clock every morning and leaving at 12? What, what, what would happen there? Would you be teaching? Do you, do you really want to teach? I've had people who have had careers that were supposed to envy and they've switched it for careers that we're not supposed to envy. So I helped someone to move from the financial services industry. She was like, it was killing her. Like she literally, she, she started to take cocaine to try and survive it. I've never taken drugs. And so that I was just like, said to her straight up, if you want to work with me, the first thing that we get sorted is, is you never doing that again. And she was up for it. And, but once we then moved her into becoming a teacher for 11, 12, 13 year old girls, her life was just so great. She, she had stepped into a life that was the one she thought she should want. And she was able to, you know, buy her own, um, like really big home at a young age. She was in her early thirties when I coached her. She already had bought her own home. She'd then bought the house next door just in case. Like, you know, she had like more money than happiness. And so for her, when she went into, into teaching, she just felt like just such a buzz. And she shared with me that she hasn't felt like using, she hasn't felt like doing drugs at all since she started doing this life. I coached her right before kind of internet and things, so I did lose touch with her, but she was so, so happy. One of the first people I coached went on to buy a farm outright, like with cash, and move her entire family onto that farm. So her mother has a house there. Um, sadly, her sibling, her only sibling passed away, but um, others, like close friends who she considers family, we talked about, you create your family, living on the property. And then she created, her, she had to recreate her own family. And she now, um, is, you know, is married with two kids, happily on the farm, doing what she loves. So what I'm saying here is do not be afraid to radically reinvent yourself, no matter what. One client of mine had been a doctor and she then became a promoter.
So let be, this be the place where even if you don't, even if you say to yourself, I'm not going to do it though, just at least admit to yourself that if you could start from scratch, that is what you would do. And a really good way to look at it is if you weren't allowed to do what you currently do, what would you do instead? Okay, stay strong. We've got another five minutes. You've got this. Well done. And what I'd like you to do as soon as we finish with this is you're going to keep sitting there or you're going to lie down even better and you're going to or maybe go for a walk. And what you're going to do is you're going to imagine your ideal day. All these things we've been talking about, all these new ways that you are these new places that you are, these new things that you're doing, all of that in an average day, not a holiday day or not a special day for any reason, but just an average day, the kind of day where you're tripping up over your Emmy on your way into the, into the toilet downstairs, that kind of a day. Um, what, what does that day look like? And just take yourself, just imagine yourself through every single step of that. And then start asking yourself, right, how much of that day can I introduce right now? So if in your ideal day, you are, you can tell I'm all about the tea, you are having a really, really great cup of um, fine china tea in a bone china cup on a balcony. Okay, you don't have a balcony, but is there locally a view that's better? You know, can you just take yourself to like the top of a hill and look down over the town? Is that better than looking out your window? Or do you know someone who has a gorgeous garden? And you can say to them something like, listen, I'd love to, you know, come in and um, just have a cup of tea with you every now and then because I just I, I adore your garden. Or like, you know, just find a way, make a way to live as much of it as possible. I'll bring the tea. Can you can you get the tea? So you're going to be looking at what can you do, how much of that ideal dream life that you're designing and you're going to continue to design after I finish talking, you're just going to keep going with it, you're going to stay excited, you're going to stay up, you're going to stay passionate, you're going to stay knowing that this is yours because you've only got one lifetime, stop messing around here, all right? Too many people are living the way that, that the, the kind of the grindy, crunchy, slow way, don't do that, just say, right, making this happen. And then the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to speak to three people and you're going to ask for things of three people. You're going to go up to three people and you're going to say, hey, um, it doesn't matter if they say yes or no. That's not the point. The point is you're going to start to exercise that muscle that then steps you into the dream. And you're going to go up to one person and say, hey, you know, um, I'd, I'd love to come around someday and uh, sit in your garden and, um, and, and read. Um, maybe when you're out and, you know, maybe there's something I could do for you in return. And maybe that neighbor will say something like, oh my God, yeah, no one ever goes into the garden. Like I never go into my garden, right? So if a neighbor of mine said, hey, can I, can I come and sit in your garden? I'd be like, uh, I think there's a key for the back door. Let me give that to you anytime you want. Knock yourself out. No one has. It's fine. Um, but basically a lot of what is in your dream, you think is going to be difficult and you think, that you have to do it all on your own. So two things, it's going to be a lot easier than you think. Someone can already give you a lot of it today, right? I've got um, clothes that I bring down to um, different, um, usually to the Oxfam on Kensington High Street. But if I didn't do that, I, what I would do, it, like it, it, supposing a teenager come up to me and said, um, hello, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking to, you know, one day I want to be able to dress like you do. And so I was just wondering if you had any, um, if you had any, uh, outfits that are, um, you know, amazing, um, that you are going to be uh, giving away to charity, um, would you mind uh, giving them to me first? Or uh, would you mind telling me when you're going to give them to charity so I can buy them? Or if someone came up to me and asked me that question, suddenly they would be my person. And every single time I was letting an outfit go, I would I would call up that young kid and I would say, hey, I've got this for you. Right. Or if someone came up to me and said, you know what, I really um, what I don't have my own. I don't have my own phone um, and I really want to be able to read on my commute. I'd be like, I got books for you here. Have this, have this, have this. Or go into my library, choose three books, as long as it's not the Eugene O'Neill or whatever. But basically, you know, 
if when people do ask me, I always want to, you know, as, as long as it's not costing me my dream and my energy. Um, but usually it doesn't. Usually it adds to my dream. It adds to my energy. So I want you to start asking, right? Asking with no expectation. Just, hey, I just want you to know that this is part of my dream. And if you if you know someone who can hook me up with this or um, if you can do that yourself, um, just know that that's something I'm looking to make happen right now. Really simple, elegant phrase. All right. So well done you, well done for this, well done for Dreaming Big, because this really is, is what has always made the world uh, heal itself and get better, is people who have so-called impossible dreams. Um, so you're going to be the inspiration for everyone that you love, um, including the people who you haven't yet met who you're going to love. You're going to be their inspiration. I know that I am for so many people who I started out with. Um, so many people will say to me now that, um, you know, if it wasn't for you, I dot, dot, dot. So you're, you are already and you're going to even in an even bigger way, you're going to be that for so many people. So um, the world is moving in a great place. It really is. And you have to be one of the early adopters of that uh, for this era, for this era where we're living in an era that needs heroes and um, dreaming big is hero work. So well done for doing that and continue to do it. And if there's any way that I can help you, just reach out. Most of you will already know how to do that. It's info at judymay.tv, info at judymay, J-U-D-Y-M-A-Y dot TV as in television. Alrighty, well done you. And um, I will, I'm sure, be living the dream with you very, very soon. Take care now.